Hey everyone, it's Chris the Primogen here and today I figured we could talk a little bit about something that I did a presentation on quite a long while ago for my patrons. This was um, part of something that I was offering. I was doing some seminars that was talking a little bit about running games and I figured I could dig up this content and I could just kind of get the ball rolling and talk about it here. So this is not the recording I made back there, but this is the original PowerPoint slide presentation that I made. So I figured we could go through it and I'm going to talk a little bit about something uh, because I wanted to share uh, some of my thoughts about running games rather than talking about some lore. I have lore videos in the works. But it's just, uh, yeah, the less said about that, the better. It's it's in the process, it's in the making. I have been working on a Cappadocian script for a little while now, but I've been just, uh, yeah, it's what it is. So we're gonna talk about giving the players what they want today. This is basically a seminar about how I approach running a game um, and also how I think you as a player should approach playing a game. So to preface it, preface preface this uh, I'm going to obviously start by saying this is just one way of doing this and it's not applicable to everyone and it's certainly not proven the best way of doing things this is just how I like to do things so approach it however you want but just kind of come in with an open mind and and I think if you've ever listened to sweet rolls which is something I was doing a long time ago you might have heard this stuff before uh, but this is giving the players what they want which is a in my opinion one of the most crucial elements of or rather one of the biggest mistakes a lot of new storytellers and uh, game masters uh, suffer from when they're running a game now obviously I don't run games anymore because of a lot of things, a lot of reasons, but I still think that these ideas uh, are applicable and maybe in the future I will be running games and this is kind of a core belief that I adhere to. This comes from um, a group I've been playing with since I was very young and we kind of settled on the idea that if you're running a game um, together with other people who are your friends, ultimately uh, you're either going to branch into one of two different paths you will either become the enemy of the players or you will become the co-player of the players. Now, this is a gross, gross simplification, of course, but this is the kind of uh, arguing we had. We had long discussions about like what makes a good game uh, good. So credit to, to, especially to Martin, a friend of mine, Martin. Uh, he and I, he's, he created what we call the Burr effect in the group, um, something I might cover later, but this is a huge um, element to his storytelling, so I would probably not have made this if it wasn't for him. So let's get let's get on with it. First of all, some things to keep in mind. Um, yeah, <laughs> this is for the people watching when I was doing this for patrons, so this doesn't concern us because this is a pre-recorded thing that I'm doing now. But yeah, I had this, this going on because I wanted to kind of uh, kind of expedite the process, so to speak. We had a three hour seminar, so I'm not going to talk for three hours today, but wow, after these seminars, I was usually completely uh, drained. But today's content is going to be what is the purpose of role playing? And this is going to be a pretty long list, so I'll just go through this pretty quickly. But what is the purpose of role playing? How do you win? Quotation marks. Uh, what do players usually want when they're playing a game? What do player characters usually want? This distinction is very important, we'll get to that later. Why is knowing this important? Why do we have to ask ourselves these questions? Uh, do I have any advice for players before session one? Yeah, well, first of all, we have a session zero, but things to keep in mind before that. Any advice for storytellers before session one? Uh, I had a little break in there, probably not gonna have that. What about giving players what they want, which is of course the entire theme for this presentation? And why should we do that? We'll get into that later have some real life examples. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the hero's journey and its subversions, which is, is classic storytelling. I don't even want to call it the trope. I think it's just a way of constructing a story that's uh, very useful when you are when you're considering arcs in a story. Some group or solo exercises. I'll present these. Obviously, you don't have to do them, but I think this is a good way of kind of getting into the mentality of this sort of stuff. Some common pitfalls uh, and then some final pieces of advice. And then questions, of course, which again, we won't have here, uh, but I have with my patrons. So what is the purpose of role playing? I think uh, most of us are pretty aware of what this might be. Also, pardon the late 90s uh, <laughs> PowerPoint presentations without the fancy effects. Uh, I'm kind of old school in teaching. I generally don't use PowerPoint to do uh, a lot of stuff on the whiteboard. So 
this is going to be a pretty dry uh, thing going on. So you might consider having this running in the background. You don't, really don't need to look at the screen for this because there's nothing fancy going on. This is, by the way, from Black Dog Game Factory, a fake ad for their game. I don't even remember what it's called, but it's one of those Werewolf the Apocalypse uh, funny little things where they, they made a game where I think Lupine or something. Anyway, some reasons you might be role playing could be to develop your social skills. It's kind of like a social sandbox. And what I mean by that is that it's a way for you to kind of explore in a safe environment different ways people behave and act. You can try to be different from who you are. You can try your um, your social skills. You can develop in a kind of a simulation. It's a simulation, really, of, of, of a real world. Not necessarily our world, but a real world. Now, I, at the time I made this, it didn't occur to me how much I rely on this, but um, with my recent diagnosis um, of being on the spectrum, I, I kind of understand now more than before that I really enjoy this aspect of role playing, and I think that's partly because it helped help me develop my own kind of uh, help me develop my social skills, so to speak. But it could also be an exploration of morality and of different mindsets. I touched briefly on this just now, but basically you can play as whatever in a role-playing game. So let's say you're a goody two-shoes, you're, you're a boy scout, um, and you're playing a game and you want to play a blackguard paladin, for example. And that's a perfectly valid thing to do, and, and role-playing games usually provide you with the systems and opportunities to play a bad person, so to speak. So in that sense, uh, role-playing games allow you to kind of inhabit the body of someone very different from yourself uh, and with a very different moral code from yourself and uh, kind of see where that takes you. And I th I think, and this is obviously not a revolutionary thought, that, but I think that role-playing really, really does help us understand other human beings and especially help us understand uh, other perspectives in terms of priorities and politics and in social issues and family and all those kind of things if we allow ourselves to not be ourselves in role playing in that sense i think it's a really uh, valid way of learning about others um, and i don't mean to 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 drag down people who only play characters pretty similar to themselves i also strongly believe it's impossible for us to play something that we are entirely unfamiliar with we kind of had to find that nugget within ourselves this kind of perspective i guess you can kind of compare a human being to a to a faceted gem and you can look through different facets to see the same thing from different perspectives it's very poetic right there but yes uh, i think um if, if you only limit yourself to playing characters very similar to yourself or without a very good motivation which we'll get to later this aspect will often be lost to you or diminished be diminished it's also creative practice to exercise your mind's eye this is a fancy way of saying it helps your imagination develop, which, uh, yeah, I think both your imagination but also your vocabulary definitely expands from role-playing game. uh, role games. Uh, and um, I think definitely as a storyteller you work very hard to kind of find the good middle ground between, between being too descriptive and being just descriptive enough. So that's really a good... Um, way for you to kind of work on your narrative skills and as a player as well like you don't want to take up too much space you don't want to describe every single one of your actions to in detail so you're gonna to have to find that sweet sweet middle ground of being descriptive but not overtly so it's also a freer form of gaming that prioritizes player agency and what i mean by that is that players generally have a lot more say in what happens in a role-playing game at least in a good game in my opinion, or at least in a game that has the time to be a good game in this regard. Um, obviously a game ran at a con will have less of this because it's a very limited time game. I think it just got a message. Uh, <laughs> I'll edit that out of post. Uh, but basically, a free form of gaming that prioritizes player agency. So, uh, in a role-playing game, uh, your options are mostly just limited by imagination, both on your end and the storytellers. And so, I would uh, absolutely argue that role-playing games provide 
in a sense, uh, a freer gaming experience. Like a lot of times people used to talk in the 90s and the, the aughts about like being able to do whatever you want in a game. And I think a lot of people who like games like Elder Scrolls or GTA or uh, other kind of games like EVE Online, for example, is a good example of that. Like there is a lot of autonomy. You, like you can you can do a lot of things. You can visit a lot of different places. But ultimately, it's still limited by the scope of the game. It's still limited by the budget. It's still limited by the production value. Those kind of things. But a role playing game is only really limited by the people playing it. So I think it's pretty neat. It's a fun way to spend time with people as well, possibly friends. And this should not be, this should not be diminished. This is a very, very good reason to be role playing. Um, personally, uh, I walked out of a game with the same group I mentioned before at one point in my early twenties because uh, this this has never really been my main motivation to role playing, uh, which is a little bit selfish, I, assu I, I would assume. But I, I find role playing not to be the most fun thing I can do with my friends. Um, I, I, I find role playing, for me, it's very pretentious, but I find role playing to be a very kind of almost a sacred experience, almost a, a spiritual experience in that regard, which is kind of a strange thing to say, I admit. But for me, role playing is very, uh, it's very close to my heart. So it's not fun in the way that people say, you know, carnival fun or let's kill some monsters fun. It's more like, uh, it's more like a um, it's self improvement uh, for me. It's it's a collective experience. It's kind of like going to church if you're a religious person. It's kind of like going to mass. You wouldn't say that it's fun, but it's definitely something that binds you together. Like I'm talking as a person who doesn't go to church, but I kind of always always assume that people who go to church they don't go because it's fun. Oh, fun is a bad descriptor because it can mean a bunch of different things but people go to church for another reason and they do it as part of a community so in that sense i guess i appreciate that it's a game it's also a game it's a way to spend time uh in an entertaining way so with all these highfalutin words of what role playing can be ultimately it's a game it's what you make of it so if you just want to kill goblins for five hours you kill goblins for five hours no one can tell you you're doing it wrong because there's no right way of role playing I mean, I'm kicking in a lot of open doors here, and um, I'm going to try to do a lot. Uh, I have, think I have 10 of these seminars I'm going to try to go through over time. Uh, but I really wanted to get to like the ground floor. So the reason I'm saying these things in the beginning is because I want everyone to have like a, like a shared common ground of what I'm talking about when I'm doing these presentations. So it's very important uh, th that that I'm, I'm thorough in these explanations because I don't want people to go in with like a... Um, not understanding where I'm coming from because then uh, a lot of what I'm trying to talk about uh, will be lost. So I might be very uh, overly talky in this video and I definitely am going to tell you things you already know. Uh, a lot of you have probably already clicked off the video which is fine but this is me trying to do something else because I, um, I, I, I wanted to talk about this stuff for a long time and I've brushed on it occasionally during streams but this is me recording without a script by the way but this is just enough of a script for me to talk off of so uh, I'm not gonna linger on this point for too long but this is something I really wanted to get out because um, I started in podcasting really uh, and we talked a lot about this stuff but this is more refined I guess anyway I, I don't think I missed anything here this was a general question just to make sure people are paying attention there's probably other reasons people roleplay uh, developing your acting skills maybe preparing for a movie uh, fil a, a movie f uh, filming is it called a filming uh, basically getting into your roles all these kind of things improv theater all that stuff but yeah how do you win this game? The eternal question that everyone who's into role playing gets asked every time they tell people they like to role play because role playing games implies that there's a way of winning, apparently. So what even is winning in a role playing game? Um, it differs between games, obviously. Uh, I could be lazy here and say that the point of Dungeons and Dragons is to hit level 20, become a god. That's not the point of D&D. I, I don't think it is. D&D uh, doesn't really have a point anymore. Um, uh, just like every other role-playing game, basically. Um, at least there's no winning in D&D, unless you're playing like um, a pre-made adventure. But even then, those often lead into other pre-made adventures. 
but it's di it differs. Uh, a, a computer role-playing game has a set story, so winning means you become Dova Keen or whatever, you, you kill all the evil dragons and you save or condemn uh, the place in the north, whatever it's called, Skyrim, that's what it's called. Um, other games don't. Bloodlines obviously has a goal, a way of winning, several different endings actually, but Vampire the Masquerade does not have a way of winning. And in fact, Vampire the Masquerade subverts a lot of traditional role-playing uh, motivations, really. Uh, we'll get into that later. And it also differs between players, um, duh. Uh, some people want to role-play as a way of escapism. They want to feel like they have power and control over their lives. They want to feel like they're, uh, they have their own agency. Which is becoming more and more common, I think, because as as the world becomes more connected globally, we realize more and more, first of all, how utterly insignificant we are as individuals, but also that um, how little control we have, really, over the world around us. Our world has grown bigger, uh, larger, but our control over our world has grown less. Um, I'm not going to get into uh, philosophy and politics here, but I think a lot of people can relate to, to me saying that, because I think it's... It's just a matter of how the world works right now. Uh, I think a hundred years ago, your world was significantly smaller, and I think uh, that meant that your <laughs> your sense of self and your sense of control over your life was probably a little bit bigger, albeit uh, at the sacrifice of probably dying earlier, being more uh, susceptible to disease. Uh, there was worse. Go. Life has always been garbage. But to get back to the point, some players uh, want to suffer, uh, some players want to have drama, some players want to grow as people, some players want to kind of test the limits of this world that they're created, uh, they've created. And th these are all valid reasons to play in the game. Uh, groups obviously also have different ways of looking at this. Um, my group in real life, we tend to consider winning uh, the point where we don't want to play anymore, I guess. Um, both good and bad ways. Winning is kind of a misnomer here. Uh, I guess uh, the end of the game in that sense. Uh, but we run a game until we kind of just understand that no, no, this is not working or we're done with it. So that's when we move on. Other groups have very clear goals. Other groups, their winning is getting everyone to attend a game for six hours once a month. Everyone can just forget about the world outside of the four walls surrounding them and just hang with their friends, have a couple of drinks and really just, you know, role play. That, that in itself might be a victory. It also differs between sessions. Uh, this is more, of course, uh, tighter to tight, tightly tied to your player characters. Uh, but it could also be like as a storyteller, uh, how do how do you know that your your game session was was uh, well received? How do you know it was successful? How did you win? It's really always a very good idea to list your goals um, when you start a game to just kind of remind yourself that even if there were some parts that didn't work that well, in general you had a good time, and that's really all that matters. Um, something I should probably practice as well. I have a, I've closed my doors, uh, my door to the room, so if you hear a cat in the background, that's Victor, who's very upset that he's not allowed in here. Yeah, I hear you, baby. I'm sorry, I'm recording a thing. Uh, my view is optimal engagement. This is my personal way uh, of looking at winning a game. Not exactly a revolutionary concept. I say that, but when I read this, I was like, what the fuck do I mean by optimal engagement? Well, optimal engagement is basically making sure that everyone's having a good time and participating in the game. Now, I can't force people, this is out of a storyteller perspective, by the way, but this might as well work for players as well. Like, if I'm engaged in the game to the point where I don't check my phone every five minutes or I go out of character and chat with my fellow players and bother the flow of the game, I consider that a win. If I'm a storyteller and all the players walk away from the table saying, man, I can't wait for the next session, that is a that is a sign of success in my mind. That's that's optimal engagement. Not, not all players are going to do this. Uh, some players are more comfortable sitting back, observing and making minor actions or not even doing anything. They just want to be part of the, the, the group, which is a perfectly valid way of playing. 
Uh, I do think, however, this is going to be a little bit of a controversial opinion here, but I do think that people who people should communicate their expectations and their wants to the storyteller very clearly, uh, which requires a little bit of insight into how one enjoys a game. Because if if I join a game and I'm super psyched to play it and I spend the entire session saying three words and then walking away without a word, I might have had a great time, but there's no way that the people I play with would know unless I told them. So there's, there is the onus of of, of showing uh, appreciation as well, both to your group and to your storyteller when playing a game. Uh, it's a collaborative thing. If you go to a table, if you go to a game table and you expect to be entertained for four hours, uh, you better be paying for that because you are also there to entertain your fellow players and your storyteller. It's a collaborative effort unless you're paying. And even then it's good for them to kind of, you know, uh, do your part, so to speak. Uh, I don't think I'm going to piss anyone off saying that, but I I've met some people who, who literally only show up to be like on a roller coaster for three or four hours. And that's, uh, that's, that's rough for everyone involved, except for the person on the roller coaster, because they don't have to do anything. They just need to react. Uh, a game should be proactive, not just reactive. Anyway. What do the players usually want? Gotta drink something, I'm getting a bit of a dry throat here. <coughs> of course I <coughs> get it in the wrong pipe. But anyway, what do players usually want? Um, players, well, I mean, far be it for me to say what all players want, but uh, risk and reward scenarios, exciting challenges. Basically, you wanna, if you're playing a game, uh, you want to have that sweet spot between uh, risk of losing it all and the chance of winning it all. Martin used to say that the best thing you can do is to give the players what they want, because then they will be desperate to hold on to what they have, which will provide a lot of interesting challenges and stuff for the storyteller to use. Uh, pe people want to be challenged, I even though it's not a conventional game in that sense, you don't want to go through a session where literally nothing happens. Uh, there are, this is a careful balance of risk and reward. You don't want to have too many risks and too little reward because then it might feel like you're constantly swimming upstream. Too many rewards, it might feel unearned. It might not quite have that oomph you thought it would have as a storyteller. Some people want to have an opportunity to influence the world of the game. They want to matter. And this ties back to what I talked about before. It ties back to the, uh, the sense of autonomy, the sense of control, the sense of actually being the master of your own world. Now, obviously, you can't have every player do whatever they want in the game world, uh, um, unless by pure happenstance all the plans align and everything will work out fine. But a lot of players want to feel like their characters actually their choices matter. So if you run a game where people ha make a lot of decisions and you never, uh, you never really um, act out on those decisions, and like let's say for example they they meet the prince and the prince is being a rude asshole, uh, but the prince has a mission for them. That's what you prepared for, and the players are are being rude back. Um, a common beginner's mistake when storytelling, even a veteran can mistake this, is that they, they will they will kind of overlook these insults to the prince because uh, they haven't planned for what would happen if the prince suddenly decided to have a couple of the players uh, punished for their insolence. Uh, so this is a classic kind of trap that you can fall into if you're too set on telling your story for to the players. If you're if you think of yourself as the entertainer uh, and and don't want to be entertained yourself it's common for a storyteller to kind of just gloss over any sort of personal touch the players bring to the game, which is to the detriment of the game, because they are also fellow storytellers to you. Some players want to make tough decisions that has an impact, that have an impact, should be have an impact. Sorry, I uh, looked through this, but this one kind of, kind of went by me. Okay, so what, what does this mean? But this is kind of an, a, an evolution of what I was just talking about. Some people want to wanna play, like we talked about before, in a, in a safe, contained environment. They want to be generals and, and warlords and, and kings and queens and, and assassins. They want to make they want to make a change on this world. Again, maybe they work at McDonald's or I don't know, they, they work a 9-to-5 office job that's just killing them, killing their soul. They want to feel like 
and they have the world at the tip of their finger that they can just tap it and everything will you know change so some people want to have that um kind of weaves into the previous one i'm gonna I'm gonna sneeze Ooh. pardon me some people want to feel empowered they want to be self-realized again this is a similar theme but basically the classic power fantasy some people just i keep saying people i'm gonna say players I just figured out how to mute my mic, so that's pretty good. Uh, some players want to feel strong. They want to feel like they can push people around. They want to feel like they, they, they matter. People respect them because of their power. Self-realization, classic kind of element of, of desire for role-playing games. Some people want to explore the world their characters are in. This is the bane of any storyteller who, who dreads going off track. Per game because these kind of people will do everything these kind of players pardon me will do anything in their power to just uh sort of drift away from the storyline and be like oh yeah we need to go save the tremere primogen but i kind of want to go talk with the anarch leader and be like why would you want to do that the anarchs have nothing to do with this like yeah but i want to talk with them so this is probably, uh, most people, most players who do this probably don't go into the game saying, I'm going to challenge the storyteller. Some might, and they're assholes. Um, mostly it's just like, a, uh, maybe they have this idea, like, oh, maybe if I do this, uh, this will happen. And I think this is often actually a sign that you made a believable world to the point where the players think that things exist outside of your narration. And that's for another seminar entirely. But, uh, oh, actually, we'll get to that later um, in terms of player characters. Uh, but yeah, basically, if you have a world that seems alive, where things happen that the players aren't involved in, uh, a lot of players will immediately want to kind of explore that when they find out more about it. Plenty of other reasons, plenty of other motivations. Uh, there's a motivation for every player in the world. Uh, I talked a little bit about mine, yours might be different from these. Maybe you'll recognize yourself in one of these, or more. Sometimes we differ, sometimes we go in with one expectation and come up with another one. But what do the player characters usually want? Now this is, this is important, this is super important for your game. Uh, and this is, as a player, this is where you make it or break it. Do you want to amass power, riches, influence, or all of the above? Some player characters just want to become powerful. This is a very common uh, trait in Vampire the Masquerade. I would say maybe half the players... Oh, okay, that's a... That's entirely taken out of the air, but a lot of players probably want to have their characters become powerful. This is also a very common approach to vampire if you're from a more um if you're from a more incremental kind of game if you played a lot of done lots of dungeons and dragons for example classic dungeons and dragons again dnd has evolved quite a bit uh, but if you played a lot of classic dnd where you gain levels and you find magical gear and you gain power Chances are people sold Vampire the Masquerade to you as a game where it's like D&D, but it's like a social game. Or like, it's about vampires and a hidden society and you have power and influence. And, I mean, a lot of the backgrounds are kind of around, centered around that, like resources and contacts and influence, all that kind of stuff. It's not an unusual one for vampires. Vampires are greedy, it's pretty common. Some vampires are out for revenge. Uh, maybe it's a revenge against society in terms of like Anarch's uh, Camarilla. Maybe it's revenge against the uh, the elders who manipulated them, like classic Sabbat kind of stuff, uh, especially Sabbat turncoats. Maybe they're they're out for revenge for being treated like a like a disposable pawn. The jihad is, after all, a very influential element in the story of Empire the Masquerade. Maybe they want to change the world for better or worse. This is often like a, 
long-term goal for some vampires. They, they've decided they're going to achieve Golconda or they're going to make the world be better. They're going to fix the Camarilla. They're going to make it work for everyone. Maybe maybe they're very passionate anarchs or maybe they're, they're Sabbat. Maybe they just want to watch the world burn and destroy um, their opposition. Sometimes they want to protect the loved ones. This has become a more common theme in V5 with the touchstones. We'll touch on those in a little bit. Uh, but maybe, yeah, maybe their, their, their family is really the only thing that keeps them going, even though they might not even be in touch with them anymore. Maybe they want to explore the world they are in. Again, sometimes player and player character alignments match. And maybe the player characters are Nosferatu or Mulcavian and they just... They're just really curious about the vampire world. Maybe they're like Beckett or uh, Netchurch. They're scholars. They want to learn more about vampirism, about Cain and the Methuselahs and all that jazz. That's a perfectly valid reason to want to be in this world. Maybe they want to experience the thrill of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with worthy opponents. And maybe I shouldn't be reading word by word what I'm saying here, but chances are a lot of you are probably in a car right now where you're working and you don't really pay attention to what's happening on the screen so i'll keep reading this but yeah maybe maybe the player characters are just like classic kind of samurai want to fight strong opponents and want to test their metal against the, the the hardiest foes now i'm gonna say this is not a very conventional way of approaching vampire but it's certainly a valid one you want to get strong maybe you want to see how high up in the Camarilla you can climb, you wanna... The, the end goal isn't power per se, the end goal is beating others to that power. And so on. Plenty of other motivations could be possible. Uh, why is knowing your and the your character's motivation, why is that important? Why, why, why does that matter to the game? Um, you probably asked yourself that, or maybe you just brushed aside what I said, and well, that's obviously something you think about right when you start. Well, the complaint of railroading and what it actually means. So a lot of people, let's see here. Yes, um, I just need to look ahead a little bit because this is, uh, I wrote this, when I wrote this two years ago, I think I wrote this two years ago, close to two years ago. I was very, I had a very solid idea what I was going to talk about. Railroading is going to show up, uh, the discussion of railroading is going to show up a lot in my presentations here. Uh, and basically a standard complaint of railroading um, is people complaining that uh, th their, their characters' motivations don't matter. They're saying that the story is being told whether or not they have any uh, opinions on it. And... Um, they feel like their characters don't matter. They, it's just a story. And uh, that is the most common com complaint of railroading. Railroading is when when you're basically providing a roller coaster of experiences. Uh, the storyteller has a, uh, a story written out and it's going to be followed and the players are going to be actors in that story and they don't really have much to say about it. They can react in small ways, but they can't change the path they're on. You're following a railroad. You're not a car. You can't just suddenly decide to um, turn left you're, unless the rails provide you that. You're going to a certain destination. It's a railroad. So you're going to a destination. Um, that doesn't mean that you know where you're going. It just means that the storyteller knows where you're going. And I think that's the, that's the important part here. The storyteller already knows how it's going to end. Um, and that is railroading. The storyteller knows how it's going to end. And either you succeed to get there or you fail to get there. But there's one end in mind. Uh, now, engagement requires two parties. The players have to interact with the story as well, and this ties back to the kind of players I talked about before, who only really show up to have an experience. And this is also why I talked about motivation before I started talking about this. Because a, a lot of times when you make a character in Vampire the Masquerade, uh, you write it all out. A lot of times people kind of ask me, like, ah, do I really need to write down nature demeanor? Uh, Actually, we'll get to that in a little bit. Or do I need to write out touchstones? Why do they matter? I, I can't think of anything. And I can't think of anything is probably the the uh, uh, worst. Uh, if, if, if you find yourself in a situation where you can't think of a touchstone for your character, I'm just going to outright say it. You, your character is not ready to be played. You haven't put in enough thought into your character unless you want to get railroad. See, that's that's the thing. 
uh, if, if you don't provide the storyteller enough incentive to kind of roll with the punches and know how to include you and in your you and your character in the story of course the, the storyteller is going to default to a railroady kind of story so if you don't provide any engagement with the story if you don't provide any stakes for the storyteller to pull uh I think I'm mixing metaphors here, but if you don't provide enough engagement for the storyteller, the storyteller is just gonna have to default to what they know. This is super important. You have a responsibility as a player because you're just as much a participant in this storytelling as the storyteller is. So if you make a character that has nothing to work with, you can't complain about being railroaded. On the other hand, a storyteller needs to listen to you and pay attention. If you provide a two page background for your character where you talk about um, some ex-boyfriend that they split on really bad terms and then the ex-boyfriend uh, got embraced as a shovel head and became a sabbat, um, obviously that's something you put a lot of time and thought into. If the storyteller never t covers this in the game, um, they're not paying attention. They're not including you. And at that point, it's perfectly valid to, to, to raise a complaint in that in that sense. Um, but a PC, a player character who doesn't have a drive, who doesn't have a motivation, who doesn't have a uh, raison de temps, whatever it's called, a reason to be, they are the enemy to any game. That's why we have nature and demeanor. That's why we have ambition and desire on the character sheets. Those are not optional. They are, they, they are a core element, just as important or even more important than your strength or your intelligence or your wits. If you don't have nature demeanor on your character, how do you expect to play them unless you're playing yourself? If you are playing a character, on the other hand, and you haven't filled out nature demeanor, then it's just a matter of fact that you haven't filled those out, but you still have an idea of how this character acts and behaves. Nature demeanor are just guidelines to how to get back willpower. But they're also there to help you uh, kind of form an idea of your character. This is of course V20 earlier editions. They kind of dropped this for, for V5. Now they have ambitions and desires, which is, again, like this goes back to your, your character's motivation. Nature demeanor could be literally anything, by the way. They're just there to be like small rewards for role playing. So if, if none of the nature demeanors work with you, think up another word that describes your character. As long as you and the storyteller have a shared idea of what that means, that's fine. But if that's blank and you can't think of anything and then you act like yourself except you have fangs, you're not really playing a character, you're playing yourself. In more than one way, by the way. Stories without hooks for player characters are just amusement park attractions. Man, I wrote some really insightful stuff back then. I'm a sinner of this particular bad habit, yes. Um, I, uh, this was during Stockholm by Night, I think, or right after Stockholm by Night, uh, which in my opinion was a massive failure on my part because I was running a game for over 12 people, possibly even more, and uh, I just couldn't, I just couldn't handle all the different player characters. I tried my best to sort of bring in some elements, but there was a lot of different motivations between the players. Players were very different, had very different expectations. Um, so I kind of defaulted to the amusement park ride instead because it was so much harder for me to to do like oh I'm gonna run a game for three hours I'm not really gonna plan what's gonna happen we'll just see what'll happen because people were p paying money they were supporting me they were patrons or paying patrons so I kind of felt obligated to have a story planned out and unfortunately uh, I kind of went a little too hard on the on the details there so here's some advice for players before session one. Just take it what it is, it's advice. You don't have to follow this if you feel it's stupid. But if the story of the game wasn't happening, if, if whatever events are planned for tonight weren't gonna happen, what would your character be doing? What would your PC be doing? If the answer is you don't know what they would be doing, th the character's not ready to be played. I don't, like, I don't mean to imply that you need to have a 
our minute by minute playbook on like yeah they wake up at 8 p.m they groom themselves at 9 p.m they go to this place and then for five minutes they do this and that and that but they should have a general idea of what they're going to do most of us uh, our lives are kind of defined by our work and what we do when we're not working or sleeping all the time between work and sleep is literally uh either preparing for it or recovering from work uh, miserable lives but we still have stuff we do every day that we default to stuff might come up during the day maybe uh we'll have a baby maybe we're delivering a baby oh my god all our routines are thrown out the window which is like having an adventure which is like <laughs> very interesting comparison there but um something happens to break the routine that's what a game is it breaks the routine of your character if if you're playing a game and it's all routine then it'll get boring pretty quickly it is fine if the answer is their daily routine however but then what is that routine what was luke skywalker doing before he bought r2d2 and c3po with his uncle uh and what would have happened if he bought the one with a bad motivator what does Sasha Vikos' average night looks like? Look like, we don't know this uh, obviously because we haven't read Sasha Vikos' diary, uh, so we don't know what they do in between all the horrible shit they've done in books and adventures. Uh, but we can kind of guess. Uh, I, there is not a single person on this planet who doesn't have an average day with average stuff where they go to bed and be like, yeah, I didn't really do anything of importance today. And when you're an adult, you usually file those days away and you forget about them. But if you think about what you did today, uh, you did a lot, you did a lot of stuff. So how would that look like? Have a basic idea in your head for, for how that would look like for your character. Your touchstones have a value outside of the game. And I think the conversation about touchstones has kind of died down since I wrote this, because this was a hot topic back then. And I think it might still be on Facebook and stuff. Spoiler, I read a lot of discussions on Facebook, but I don't comment because it's the same shit all the time. But touchstones have a value outside of the game. And what I mean by that is that they exist to help you developing the previous questions. They help you design a character who is struggling with their humanity, which is a core concept of Vampire the Masquerade, especially V5. Now, if you don't want to play that way, if you don't want to play with your humanity and uh, all the core themes like that, yeah, well, I mean, V20 provides you with plenty of stuff. You have a lot of paths and you can do things differently. But even Sabbat vampires have routines. They have daily or nightly routines, rather, that they do when they're not, you know, uh, doing a... Uh, a siege or or having uh, having an inquisition running in through your town or whatever your touchstones I had to let, cough there your touchstones are there to give you something to work with they're basically a tool they are not a stone to weigh you down i'm so sick and tired of people who go i can't think of a touchstone like yeah well then maybe play another game sorry that's a controversial opinion but they're Okay, that's a little bit harsh. Uh, I'm sure I made some people angry now, but first of all, golden rule, it's your game, do whatever you want. You don't have to have touchstones in the game, but if you're not gonna have touchstones, then don't bother complaining about them. It, it's, it's like buying a golf game and complaining about, uh, I don't know, complaining about the clothes of the characters in the game it's weird it's it, yeah you don't have you don't have to be bothered by it the core mechanics are there but what you want to do with the rest of it it's up to you it's a book you can change anything you want uh and v20 is not gone it's still still around you can still buy it sorry I'm gonna try to limit the amount of ranting I'm, I'm, I'm doing here but if, if you struggle with touchstones there are even there's so much fan content out there and how to make touchstones that are not humans there are ways to make touchstones that are not humans if you really really don't want to have humans for your character that's fine it's fine you don't gotta anyway here's some more advice when you know how your character's nightly routine looks like when you're not playing them it's easier to figure out your long-term goals and ambitions let's say you're playing a Nosferatu for example all right we got a Nosferatu character going what did they do in between sessions well they're playing World of Warcraft all right fine 
we got your nightly routine. This character does not like to socialize. They sit around playing World of Warcraft. Maybe they're actually, you know what? That's that's amazing because when you're playing an, an MMORPG, you don't have to show your face. You can literally be the raid leader and have a huge social circle, and nobody would be any the wiser. So frankly, that's a great way to spend your nights if you're if you're a Nosferatu. You can play MMOs. You can play Second Life. You can become a VTuber. I mean, you. As long as your face is relatively readable by a by an iPhone, man, being a vampire in 2022 must rock. Anyway, uh, talk with the other players and make sure there is a synergy between your characters. Why are they in a coterie together? And just like in real life, there are different groups of people, uh, but friends are not colleagues, and they are not teammates, and they are not family. So we have our different social circles. Unless you live with your parents and you spend your waking days with your parents and you're you're living in their basement or whatever, um, chances are your your family you treat your family rather different from how you would treat your colleagues and you would treat your friends different from how you treat your colleagues and you would treat your coterie different as well. Why is the coterie around? I like the mechanics of V5 where they actually provide you examples of different coteries because. Uh, if, if you're just hanging out just because you're hanging out, even that is a reason in itself. So work with that. Don't just settle with, yeah, we just happen to be a coterie. All right, cool. You're all in the same guild playing World of Warcraft. Or actually, let's make that Final Fantasy XIV. You're all playing Final Fantasy XIV in the same link shell. Cool. Now you have a reason to hang around with each other. Don't just say, we'll figure that out later. Because it's a core idea. People don't... Like, your coterie are not your colleagues, right? You don't have to hang with your coterie unless, like, the prince put you in that coterie and said, all right, you gotta do shit for me. And then you already have a reason for why you're together. Don't, don't, don't skip this. This is important. If you have the time and the interest, write down your character's usual nightly routine as a short story, especially if it's seen from their mental perspective. This is a really good help for your storyteller. Consider it. I mean... It might be a lot of work. Maybe you don't consider yourself a, 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 a good uh, author or writer. Maybe you, you haven't done prose since you were in school. That's fine. You don't got to do this. But this is a really, really, uh, really useful tool for your storyteller to work with to kind of have an understanding of how your character works, much more than you explaining it to them. What is important to your character, what isn't important to your character. And this is also indirectly what's important to you, because if you only write about certain things that your character does, that also kind of shows what you think is important in the story, which means that the storyteller, okay, they, they realize that there is no mention of romantic interest at all in this story, none at all. There's no talking about emotions. Okay, fine, then maybe you as a player are not interested in having that in your game. Um, you can always, of course, tell them outright, but this is a good sign of what to focus on when writing for you or preparing a game. So for the storyteller uh, before session one, what, what should the storyteller think of, guys? We're almost at an hour, so if I'm, if I'm mumbling a little bit, it's been a long day. I hope it's, you know, I hope you can understand what I'm saying. I hope the text-to-speech function on YouTube captures what I'm saying, um, but I'll try to speak clearly. So if you're a storyteller, uh, this is before your first session, make sure that you spend time talking with each of your players about their characters. Ask questions about the characters. Think of it like you're a director and you're talking with the screenwriters. You need to understand the motivations of the characters. To, to kind of illustrate this, in the script, there is a scene where one of the characters uh, hits another one. And maybe the screenwriters were lazy that day and they wrote, uh, Carl angrily hits uh, John. John, what are you doing? Carl, you know what I'm doing. This is very difficult to extrapolate from because the motivations are extremely unclear, especially if you're making like a TV series, you're director of one episode and you haven't been paying attention. You have no fucking idea why Carl hit uh, Jim? Jack? I forgot his name. Um, John. So you might want to have to talk to the screenwriters and be like, all right, cool. Uh, you need to explain this. Why is he angry? What kind of angry is he? Uh, 
because as you all know there's angry and then there's angry there's different levels of angry there's different manifestations of angry uh, emotions are so much more complex than happy angry sad you know there's 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 varieties you could be sad because you're happy you could be sad because you didn't get a job or you could be sad because your cat died you could be sad because your lover of 12 years walked out on you there's many many different ways of being sad so ask your players um to kind of extrapolate on how their players or how their characters ask your players how their characters got a mumbling um but yeah you want to understand motivations of the characters this is also by the way where you have nature demeanor for example this is it's basically a shortcut for this ambitions and desires are excellent fodder for smaller plot lines as are all kinds of backgrounds and obviously touchstones look through and see how you can put a twist on any of it now um if you're a beginning storyteller beginner storyteller uh you don't want to you don't want to overwork yourself on this you don't want to throw in everyone's touchstones every single session um it, it, it's it's a lot of faffing about if every character has to have their moment every session sometimes it's better to just focus on one character per session makes it easier for you and be clear about that with the players like okay we're gonna have this stuff happen which i want to tackle with you guys as a group but then every session we're gonna kind of do a little um uh, gonna go with a microscope on one of you one of your characters to just kind of focus on them for their opportunity to do some solo role playing this is a better way to do it than just have like okay what do you do what do you do what do you do and then you have an hour and a half suddenly passes and the other players haven't done anything they start looking at their phones or i don't know they started talking about the game the weekend yeah you don't you don't want to you don't want to have the majority of your players not do anything for an extended period of time because that's kind of a mood killer unless they're really invested in the characters even then sitting around for four hours not doing anything but just listening it's kind of a kind of a tough ask for people so keep that in mind Maybe the player character's daughter is working with the Second Inquisition. Maybe they're hunting the player characters. These are, these are some examples I wrote down. Perhaps one of their contacts in the police informs them that they've been seen assaulting people and that there's an ongoing investigation. Oh, apparently that was all I wrote there. These are some advice for stuff you can use. Man, uh, let me just check how, how much further this is. Oh my god, this is a lot. Actually, no, no, it's not a lot. We're almost at the end. Uh, yeah, the exercise at the end, the common pitfalls. Now we're doing fine. We're doing fine. All right, let's let's go back to where we were. Okay, so this is where I had the break time, time the first time. So we won't have a break. We'll just move on to the next point. What about giving players what they want, which was the topic of this entire video? Chris, talk about this stuff. So first of all, get rid of the old started from nothing cliche. What do I mean by that? Well, um, before we go on with the next point, basically it's very, very common for every single game to start out at, at, at um, uh, what's it called? Uh, square one. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the word. So you don't have to start at square one. You really don't. You can start in media rest. You can start, let's say you start the game with the Coterie having just killed the Prince and all of a sudden they have to deal with that. That's an excellent place to start. Maybe they're already the, the, the Primogen. That's an interesting way of starting as well. Maybe the players uh, have the ear of the prince. Maybe they, they are very trusted advisors. Maybe they have a massive library of tomes that they were just handed the key to. They have the investment accounts of Mithras or the original copy of the Book of Nod. Give them something awesome. Don't be afraid to reward them, either before or early in the game. Give them exactly what they wanted. Give them something cool that everyone in this world wants. Because you want to make them powerful, you want to give them influence, let them attain their wildest dreams and reap their rewards. Because vampire tends to very often kind of fall into the pitfall of misery, misery porn. Everything is horrible. Everything is garbage. You never succeed in anything. You you're just you're just one step away from 
doing a joker literally every session and and that can be tiring for people it's like you're you're like i said before you're swimming against the stream constantly instead revert it give the players what they want ask them what what, what would your character do if you were suddenly in charge of london because that's interesting there's an entirely different sets of challenges for that one and why well because as soon as they have what they have always wanted, the risk of losing it becomes a very powerful motivator, right? Because imagine you uh, imagine you won $2 million. You've never really worried about losing $2 million, but then all of a sudden you have that money in your hand and you're like, I really better not waste this money, or you absolutely waste it, which can be interesting as well. But basically, Vampire the Masquerade is built around this in a nutshell. Like, what, the most precious thing you have, uh, the only thing you have in the classic way of starting is your humanity. That's what you have to protect. But in Vampire the Masquerade, um, the risk of loss is, is ever present. Losing your humanity, losing your touchstones, losing your touch with uh, the world around you, losing the battle of the jihad, losing your position in your clan, losing every... Loss is a very powerful motivator in Vampire, but it's always a, like a losing the very last things you have or losing what little you have. What if you have a lot and you're at risk of losing that? It, it makes the game very, very different. This strong motivator can become the main cog of the machinery and invite for player engagement and initiatives. All right, you have London. All of a sudden you're in charge of London and 36 vampires are eyeing you, kind of sizing you up, wondering, all right, all right, is this gonna work? Are they gonna let me do my thing? Am I gonna have to get rid of them? Can I influence them? Again, if you created a city that seems alive on its own, that does shit without the players doing that, it makes for a very interesting world. How would 36 vampires in London, by the way, this might be after the purge, uh, whatever it's called, the Inquisition did, that they killed it, almost every vampire in London. Um, how would that play out? That, that, that in itself is a, a very, uh, I would say, novel way of approaching vampire. I'm sure some of you uh, listening have played the game this way, but you'd be surprised how many times people just always start from square one and it's it's kind of like um it's kind of like a classic i, want to, I keep i keep reverting back to D, D, but it's like D, D has a very clear progressive route through the game and i think a lot of people just kind of want that in a game in general they kind of assume you have to start at square one and then work your way up whereas you can actually fall down in role-playing games and lose what you have um which is what we're talking about here so what are you going to do with what you got is something you can ask a player and that will give them so much more to work with so much more uh innovation uh worries uh discussion bargaining finding allies you know making sure that they don't lose what they have instead of trying to get something they don't have um because then, then they'll be more inclined to listen to the Anarchs, for example, because they see them as an actual threat to their power, rather than some side to side with in a conflict that they they have very few stakes in themselves. <clears throat> so some examples from my real life game group. Uh, in one of our games, um, we played as a revolutionary group seeking to undermine the authority of a very big city. Uh, this city had a system where uh, you could become a citizen, and if you were a citizen, you were allowed to vote. But to become a citizen, you had to um, you had to get the backing of a powerful citizen, and this essentially resulted in an aspirant system where people were being exploited for a very long time with the promise of becoming citizens. So we were vastly different people from many different walks of life who thought this system was corrupt and we wanted to change it. But why we wanted to change it was for very different reasons. We made allies with several anti-government groups early on in this game, but just a few sessions in, these gr groups gave us the opportunity for an armed coup. We were able to overthrow this system. However, we succeeded and we established a new government. That could have been the end of the story, <clears throat> but the rest of the game was literally about keeping that power and the Machiavellian infighting that came from it, because we were all, of course, very 
powerful. We were not only very powerful people, we were also very driven people. We were the leaders of our separate groups of uh, workers and all these things. You had a, you had a union leader. Um, I played as a uh, madam, a brothel madam, I think. Um, and I had very different reasons for fighting against the system that than, than the, the, the union had had. Uh, and there was a lot of betrayal going on. A very interesting game. And basically, it, 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 it turned everything upside down. Because it suddenly made us realize that our characters, now that they have their immediate goal fulfilled, they really need to st start thinking long term. And uh, that's it, 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 it makes for very interesting stories. Kind of drifting off the topic here, but uh, the hero's journey and its subversion. <laughs> very nice transition there, very smooth transition. So this is one of the oldest forms of stories humanity has. The, the monomyth, to quote Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell is, is a great read. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, he talks a lot about uh, the, the need for myths in humanity's history. Why we need these stories. We need uh, morale stories. We need uh, uh, all, all kinds of, of, of stories to kind of give meaning to stuff happening around us. Um, the, the hero's journey is basically the classic Frodo. <clears throat> Frodo faces a challenge. He's thrown into a world of adventure. He loses a lot, but he learns a lot about himself. Ultimately, he comes to overcome his personal challenges and beat the bad guy. He returns to where he was, but he returns a changed person. That's kind of the hero's journey in a nutshell. Uh, probably skipped a few steps there. But you will also see this, you will see this in so many movies and even in shorter bits like um, television series. I know uh, Rick and Morty was a strange, uh, strange example here, but Rick and Morty had this eight step uh, system to how they made their episodes. And it's very similar to the hero's journey. Yeah, Lord of the Rings and its ending subvert this uh, because the hero's journey usually ends with the hero being a better person. But in the Lord of the Rings, uh, Frodo, Frodo can't live in the Shire anymore. He's he's too hurt. He's too changed by the world outside. So he chooses to move on to leave the safety of the home. Um, a lot of stories subvert this, and I like to say that if you're going to subvert something, you have to understand what it is you're subverting. Uh, this is a common writing advice I give to some of my patrons, is that uh, you can't you can't write a non-conventional story if you don't understand the conventions. Um, the hero's journey is one of the most conventional ways of telling a story. You really have to understand why that is. It's not that someone just sat down and decided that this is how a story is going to be told. Because the hero's journey can be found all across the world in cultures very, very different from each other and very isolated from each other. And this is something much more fundamental than a set of rules that some dude just arbitrarily decided. The hero's journey is a, um, is a human uh, trait. It is something that we desire as human beings generally. It's something that it, it fulfills a need that we have. It, it's how cooking uh, is just, not, it's even more fundamental than cooking. It's part of our, it's like, a, it's in the DNA of our culture, the, our, our culture as human beings even. Your game can and should play with the hero's journey, but again, with awareness, you need to understand when and how to subvert it, if you're gonna subvert it. Nobody, nobody's gonna watch a children's movie and be like, oh, this, this, this story follows the hero's journey and it's really uncreative. Like, yeah, yeah, of course, Chip and Dale isn't gonna be the most groundbreaking, uh, hold on, gotta drink some water. Yeah, Chippendale Rescue Rangers isn't going to be subverting your expectations with the hero's journey. There might be a slight twist in it, but it's for children. Um, nobody's going to complain about children's movies being predictable, and if they do, they're a jackass. But if you're, ri if you're writing, like, if you're writing adult stories, um, then it's fine to subvert things, but you should be subverting with awareness of what it is you're subverting and what changes you're bringing to the story like that. I'm a huge fan of anime. 
uh, that came out of left field, but as if you know me, you know me. Um, anime is often very, very predictable. Shonen anime, doesn't matter if it's Demon Slayer or if it's Naruto or if it's One Piece, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Actually, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, interesting enough, is one of the most subversive uh, shonen out there. I wouldn't even call it shonen, to be honest, but they are extremely simply stories, simple stories. Boku no Hero Academia, My Hero Academia, it's, it's so it's so mind-dullingly predictable but that's not why you're watching it you're not watching it to be wowed you're watching it because it's a story that brings comfort uh, which goes back to what i was saying about how it being part of our genetics our dna if you want to read more about this the hero with a thousand faces absolutely available basically everywhere google that and you'll find the pdf in no time it's an old book but the hero with a thousand faces is if you're if you're going to be a storyteller um and you want to you want to think about your stories in a, in a, in a, in a wider scope, read The Hero with a Thousand Faces, because uh, so many movie directors have read this and worked with this, so many writers, so many actors, it's just like reading 101, storytelling 101, really. Uh, here's an exercise I made for my viewers, or the, the pa patrons. I'm gonna pr present it here, you can do it with yourself or with the group if you want, but it's an interesting way of kind of working with what we've been talking about before. There is a group of four player characters. There's a venture stockbroker who has just been given free reigns after 15 years of tutelage under an emotionally distant sire. They have a burning desire to rule over someone else for a, cha for a change, and they have a large amount of money tucked away. The character, that is, not the, not the sire. They, the character has an, a burning desire to rule over others, so lord it over others. There's a Torador club owner who doesn't know their sire, having instead been adopted by the local degenerates, quotation mark, who has put them in charge of the club as a test of their skills. They hate kindred politics, even though they are remarkably good at it. And of course, to clarify, degenerates in this sense are the Torador, not some other group. I, someone made a comment about that recently. It's like, yeah, it's, it's a term that's been around since the 90s for this. I'm not gonna change how I use it. A Malkavian shovelhead who was left behind when the Sabbat pack moved on. They tried to be as human as possible to avoid falling to the beast, including pushing themselves to feed on animals and to spend the nights doing human things, quotation marks. They're excellent, and they're excellent at socializing and quote unquote being human. And then finally, a ministry, or a follower of Set previously, who got embraced during the IT boom of the late 90s, early aughts. They are good at convincing people to make poor life choices and has been living fairly aimlessly for the last 10 or so years. But they feel their humanity is slipping, they need a purpose and people to care about. These are the four characters we have. Now, I when I wrote this, I was expecting a little bit more than three people to show up, which is how many showed up, but a lot of people watched the VOD afterwards. But basically, you can split yourselves into groups of two to three people and like to try to discuss a scenario where these pieces get what they want and when, and where you then try to think of a plot thread where you keep the story going in a fun and engaging way using what we've talked about. Here are some general tips. I feel like I totally f flipped the description here. Try to think of the players more than the PCs. Maximize player engagement even if it is at the expense of the PCs. What I mean by this is don't necessarily be nice to the player characters if it means the players will have a more enjoyable time. Don't be illogically cruel or punishing to the player characters. It's important to keep the suspension of disbelief. I, I will say this again uh, and I will be even more direct and say that Unnecessary cruelty is a poor narrative device. Unnecessary cruelty is a poor narrative device. Many times a storyteller will have an almost comically evil villain who will hurt people just for the sh shit of it. They're a sociopath, they're a psychopath. They, 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 um, they will uh, unabashedly hurt and uh, people kill innocent people, just be generally evil. Um, these don't make for very interesting villains, and they make for very unrealistic villains. So if you want to tell a realistic story, don't overdo it. Like even if you read, um, if you read, uh, I was gonna say Tra <laughs> Travis's diary. If you read uh, Beckett's Jihad Diary, you will realize that Sasha Vikos, who's always been portrayed as a really evil kind of character, really 
has some petty moments <laughs> in, in in there that shows that they're like at, at at the bottom of it they're still kind of human even if they're a very different kind of human than they used to be Contrarywise, don't heap too much good stuff on the players or the player characters. Keep them wanting more. This is a pretty complex challenge, but basically what kind of a story could you tell with these four? So it's a thought experiment. You can actually write in the comments. If you, if you have a good idea for this, write in the comments. I'll read them. Uh, and <laughs> I can't believe I have to preface it by saying I'll read them. I read all my comments, period. I always read the comments. That's like one thing I do. Every morning I wake up, I open YouTube Studio and I read the comments. That's what I do. I, I don't answer them or reply to them because I'm, I'm, I'm shy and I'm also low energy. But yes, uh, I will read your comments. If you if you can think of a fun scenario to do with these four characters, then just, just hit me with them. I, I'd love to read some. Blah, 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 blah. Here's some reflections on this exercise. Um, now, I think we are close to the end. So these are some common pitfalls uh, that, a play that a storyteller or player might fall into. Uh, the classic players versus storytellers. Uh, this is uh, because it's a game and uh, sometimes we'll get heated. Sometimes we really want to win and sometimes we kind of bleed into our characters or our characters bleed into ourselves. And we take, we take it personal. We take failure personal. We take um, nastiness personal and we decide that we're gonna show that person that we're gonna win this one this is not a good thing uh, in general in my opinion I think I think it's just breeding ground for misunderstandings and kind of it's it can sour the table pretty quickly so as a storyteller um, try to try, try to hold back on, on like really like insurmountable threats in the sense that don't throw like don't throw Sasha Vikos at the players to just show them how weak they are compared to some of the established characters in this setting because I'll be I'll be honest it's probably not gonna have the effect you thought it would it's either gonna have them be dead set on actually beating Sasha Vikos so much that they will derail your campaign or they're just gonna be demotivated or they'll be like okay cool but what's the long-term impact of that on the story uh, unpredictable behavior as a player uh, try to try to try to make realistic decisions for your characters even if you're playing Malkavian uh, try to operate within the boundaries of the story you're there to have fun don't fuck with your storyteller just because you can uh, they're a human being just like you and I can guarantee you they haven't spent every waking hour of their life predicting every single thing that you might be able to do as you play a character like this is you're not glitching out of the map in a computer game you're making your storyteller frustrated it's two very different things uh be kind of clear unclear proceedings what did i mean by this uh unclear proceedings i'm gonna have to try to proceedings what did I mean by that? <sighs> okay, I, I, I legitimately cannot comprehend what I was talking about there. So we'll just move on to out of character reasons. This is the bleed I was talking about. Bleed is the enemy of the game. Because if you start taking things personal in a game like Vampire, very soon um, your motivations will bleed in with the uh, character's motivations, which is not going to be fun because then the game will be more about you and what you want rather than the group and what the group wants and it won't be a collaborative thing it will be you versus the storyteller you wanting to get what you want so don't go for out of character reasons motivations try to try to try to be neutral you're not winning this this, this entire seminar has been about the fact that it's not a conventional game where you win you don't beat the final boss and you get the end credits winning is something you decide together as a group so if out of character you have an idea of how you're going to win the game bring that up with the storyteller players versus players just as damaging as well if you have ambitions that clash between each other if you have different um ambitions um 
maybe one character wants to make the city Camarilla, or rather rule the Camarilla, and another player wants to uh, bring in the Sabat, maybe they're a Sabat sleeper agent. At some point, uh, these two ambitions are going to come at a clash, so be ready for that, and for God's sake, stay in character, don't let it bleed into out of character. Don't keep secrets from each other. Uh, this might seem like a weird thing, but in my experience, unless you unless you have a really good reason, like unless you're playing a game that's specifically players versus players, which, by the way, can be really fun, especially if it's like, oh, we have full control over London, but only one of us should be Prince, which is a fun premise. Don't don't keep secrets at the table. I know it's really tempting to send like a little note to the storyteller and be like, hey, I'm gonna follow that player, I'm gonna listen in on what they're doing. But you're, you're, you're actively taking entertainment away from the table. If you're doing things in secret, it's, it's like, okay, yeah, but that's, people are gonna wanna react to that. And if they're good players, they're not gonna act on it. Don't act on things you don't know. This is tempting to do sometimes, like, oh yeah, I know that I'm being followed. Okay, let's take a situation here. I'm, I'm gonna go meet up with my Sabat contacts, and another player goes, I'm gonna follow behind. And I am I go, okay, I'm gonna roll awareness. And I roll, uh, for some reason, I'm suddenly very suspicious. I roll awareness, and I fail. And the storyteller goes, oh, you don't see anything strange. And then be like, well, I kind of feel like there's something strange going on. I'm gonna keep rolling awareness. Like, don't do that. Don't do that. Give them, give them that. Give the other player that, because I can guarantee you something cool is going to come out of one of the player characters overhearing another player characters talking with a sabat. Like, d don't take that role playing opportunity off the table by being secretive about it. Don't send notes unless, unless you you like. Maybe send notes to the storyteller if uh, if you. Um, if you want to prepare them for something that you're going to do openly on the table so that they're ready for that. I think that's the only reason I think you should be sending notes to the storyteller unless it's specifically a players versus players game. And those are kind of hard to run. But don't keep secrets from each other because you're making the game less fun. You're, or rather you're keeping fun stuff off the table. So prepare your storyteller uh, if you have to. But, but also, uh, on the other side, probably, let's see if I mention that. Yeah, oh, see reasons. Don't begrudge another player for things their character does. If you, well, actually, yeah, clashes of personality. We'll do that one first. Um, if two player characters are very, very different, uh, or two players are very, very different, uh, this can cause tension, friction. Maybe we have a power player. And maybe we have one of those people who enjoy um, being weak and pushed around and, you know, trying to trying to play something they're not, for example. Uh, these two can come at, come to heads. They might have an argument. Uh, they might, the argument might evolve into uh, kind of frostiness. So try to, try to always leave the table uh, at peace with each other. If, if, something sh if something pops up that really bothers you, ask for a little time out and handle it out of character. Don't hold grudges. And for God's sake, don't read into people's behavior. This is something I'm so bad at. I do this all the fucking time. This is part of, for me, it's part of masking as, a, as an autistic person, as a person with autism, sorry, as a person with autism uh, and mask, I, I, I mask severely. Like it's, it's, uh, it's, it's led to me having GAD, general anxiety disorder. I read so much into expressions and things that people don't actually say. And I'm always wrong. And even if I'm not wrong, I make it a much bigger deal than it is. So if you're, if you're suspecting if, if you feel like another player is out to get you or they don't like you, fucking bring it up, be an adult. Don't just go around being angry about it because no one, no one wins from that. And if it really gets to the point where you can't play with them, leave the table. One of you leave the table, find another room. Don't force yourself into playing with people you don't like. It's just nobody wins. So, like I said, out of character reasons. I cannot stress this enough. All, whenever, if you ever find yourself making a decision based on out-of-character knowledge that your character should not know, 
or if you're a storyteller and or a player and you notice one of the players doing this gently remind them that do you actually does your character know this because again this is bleed many many times we will not be aware ourselves that what that we're doing this this is uh we act on impulse because we're we're interested in the game we're engaged in the game we really care about what's going on so we kind of act on stuff that we shouldn't know in the game it's it, it's uh, very easy to do so gently remind the player responsible for this or for that matter the storyteller if the storyteller does this which is even worse uh you shouldn't really be aware of this shouldn't be aware of this and i'm not saying that be well i'm actually saying that because i am um, uh, this kind of behavior is even more common in people who uh, who are afraid of loss and before i go on i just need to elaborate on this and again this is not a judgment but a lot of people uh myself sometimes included are very sensitive to being in a position of weakness because you're exposed, uh, you can come off as being not so intelligent, uh, or you can come off as being kind of clumsy or goofy, and we kind of don't want that. We don't want to be in that situation. We want our peers to see ourselves at our best. So we will subconsciously uh, work with everything at our advantage to kind of prevent that from happening. We have to suppress this for a game. We have to understand that we have to trust in the other players and the storyteller that at the end of the day the only reason our character failed at what we did is because it will make for a good story i think that's very important to keep in mind it's something you need to remind yourself of again and again because i have to do that and if i have to do that everyone has to do that <laughs> let's move on <sighs> Finally, I think these, these are some, yes, these are some past, well, we're very close to the end. Don't do it my way. Don't permanently accelerate the story. And this is, this is a, a common pitfall for storytellers. And I, I, every single time I've, I've run a game, I've done this. I take on too much responsibility for the entertainment of my players. So I will constantly throw new things at the players. I will constantly put them in challenging situations and I will constantly come up with new stuff going on because I'm worried that the players are gonna be bored or that they're going to sit there and be like, all right, so is that it? Is that the end of the ride? And I, and I think, honestly, it it's a sign of being a control freak to a certain extent. I can say that because I am. And I also think it's kind of rude towards the players because you're kind of assuming that they're not capable in doing anything on their own. And you're also scared that they're going to do something that you can't, that you can't act on. This is a prestige thing a lot of times. You want to provide as good of an experience as possible. You want to be a good storyteller, trademark. You want to be Matthew Mercer. You want to have a situation for every possible scenario. Well, I got news for you. You're not Matthew Mercer and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you can just say to the player, okay, I don't know how to respond to this. So we're going to shelf that for a little while so I can think of a good response to it and then we'll get back to it. That's something I do in teaching uh, a lot. If I don't know the answer to something and, it, and I'm in a flow, I'll just tell the student, all right, I'm gonna write that on the whiteboard. I'm gonna write down your question. At the end of the lesson, we'll figure out what it, what it is, but we can't do that right now because we're talking about something else. Shelf it. Don't be afraid to shelf things that are out of the left field that you're not prepared for. And take it easy. Sometimes it's fine to just hang out in your haven with your coterie for a whole game. That's fine. Sometimes that's just how you want to vibe. So don't, don't permanently accelerate your story. Don't keep raising the stakes every single time because that ain't good for the game. So keep these very important things in mind. I do believe this might be the last slide. I'm probably gonna eat up my words, but no one can read your mind. No one can know your motivations. No one can know your reaction to what other people do. I'm not saying you have a responsibility to explain uh, how every little thing someone does annoy you if that person is being an asshole, but you kind of have a responsibility to, to yourself. If you find yourself in a situation that is entirely unple unpleasant for you, you can't expect people to understand that it is that way unless you express that. Um, as a storyteller, create a space where people can tell you these things. 
either in private or as a group, as a deflation of the game. When the game is over, spend 20, 30 minutes at least to just hang out, just talk. And if you've ever worked in crisis management or if you know people who do, uh, there's a classic saying that in the last five minutes of a meeting, all the bad shit happens. Because that's when people kind of finally decide to, uh, to say the controversial things that they've been thinking the whole time. If you're playing with strangers, if you're playing with people you don't know, you, this is even more important. If you're playing online, especially if you're playing online, you have to be very clear with your emotions and your feelings. And if you're playing with people you don't know, you have to be very clear where your boundaries are. It is not their responsibility. If you haven't been clear with your boundaries, it's not their responsibility if you, are, if you feel uncomfortable in a game to a certain extent. Um, this is why you have a session zero. You have a session zero to kind of at least give people a basic insight into how you feel about this stuff. Of course, there might be situations that come up that none of you could have predicted. Perfectly fine to say time out. You should say time out. Never sit through a scenario that makes you feel uncomfortable Unless you're okay with feeling uncomfortable about that. I had to pause there, I had to phrase that in a certain way. I have been in role-playing scenarios where I have felt very uncomfortable, where I have felt scared for my life, uh, where I have felt very threatened, but that has been with very close friends who, who all knew and trusted each other explicitly and knew that if we ever pushed it to the point where uh, it was too much, we would say it was too much. And when I say I felt scared for my life, not that I've had a gun pointed at my head or something like that, but that my, I've been so invested in the game that the emotions my character felt were like, I, I tend to bleed a lot. So for me, it works because I kind of, I kind of have a good control over it anyway. But even then, sometimes I bleed too much uh, into my character and the character bleeds too much into me. If you're recording a game, why are you recording a game? I have a lot of opinions about this, but if this is your first time recording a game or playing with a group, you got to make sure you're not doing things that uh, might get you in trouble. I would never suggest a new group of people who don't know each other to sit down and play a game online and record it. Never. It is very dangerous. Uh, it can lead to some really bad shit. Uh, because once it's out there, you have no idea who's going to save it. And if you accidentally do or say something that felt okay at the time, yeah, don't, just don't do it. Only play online, on stream, with people you trust, and with very clear rules. And even so, restrain yourself. Practice restraint. Make sure that you're very aware of what's going on because your way of communication might be very clear to your fellow players, might not be so clear to people watching you. And a five second clip taken out of context, it's gonna, I can hurt. I'm not talking out of experience. So far I have not been in that situation, but I've seen that happen. And it's not, not, it's not pretty for anyone involved. It's fine to wanna play a dungeon crawl, or to go murder hobo. It's a game, you do whatever you want. Spend that entire session just focusing on hunting. It's your game. Everything I've said here, they are opinions and advice. Opinions and advice are not rules. Don't go quoting me and saying, you're not running a game the way the Primogen says you should be running a game. What's wrong with you? Uh, unless you think that's a really funny joke. I would never, ever, watch a game being played and be like, why are you guys doing this? I tend uh, I tend to be rather contrarian. I tend to not offer advice unless I'm asked to, even when I see something's not working. Um, quite frankly, I don't think it's any of my business. I don't know the entire situation. I, I'd rather err on the side of cautious. If people are being hurt, that's another thing. I'll probably raise my voice then, but I, 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 I can't police how people make their content and I don't think anyone should. Uh, but if you are putting your content out there in public, it's public. 
it, it is a God-given right for people to be allowed to criticize the content you make. And it's a God-given right for people who get their content criticized to bite back and not ha not... I, I get people. I get people in my comments saying things. Most of the time, I don't care. Sometimes I just go, well, shrug emoji, whatever. You can have your opinion. I legitimately care enough that I'm going to make fun of you. That's my God-given right as a content creator, I'm not stirring the pot. I'm just showing you that your opinion about this particular thing in this video, it doesn't matter. Anyway, <laughs> I have no idea how much time we have left. I did this in an hour and a half. Uh, seems about right. Any questions or comments, leave them in the comments. Uh, next seminar, these are already decided. This video will be uploaded for all of my viewers. Uh, I had people watching, so they were actually asking me questions in real time, but that video is never gonna go public. I promised my, my, my patrons that and I'm gonna stand by it. Uh, I, I was already a little bit skeptical about uploading this because I felt mm, this kind of stuff, should I really, uh, should I be showing this? This was exclusive content, but it's been almost two years. So I feel like I can show this. Also, I really wanted to upload something because I am so angry at myself for not doing that. And it's, it's, I have stuff ready. I have audio edited. I just can't sit down and do it. I'm so tired after work. I'm so tired with all the stuff I'm doing. This is the best I can do. So this is an hour and a half of giving the players what they want. Thank you very much. If you listen through all this, I really appreciate it. This was a flow of the mind presentation. It will be unedited. I've only muted myself when I'm, I didn't mute my sneeze. That's right. Uh, pardon me for that one. But I muted myself uh, drinking some water and stuff. So uh, I'll upload this right away because otherwise I'm just going to keep pushing that forward. Thank you so much for watching, for tuning in. Sorry there was no avatar talking during all this. This might not be the kind of content you're here for. Um, well, that's too bad. Uh, this is the kind of content I like to make. Um, and uh, there will be more of these because I this actually felt really good. I'm very happy with this. There will be shorter lore videos coming. I just don't know when. Sorry, I don't know when that's gonna come out. I'll, I'll, I'm doing my best. <laughs> I, re I really am. I'm very sorry there's not much more content. Enough pity uh, farming for that. So hope this helped you out. If it did, leave a comment in the comments below, I guess. Uh, and take care and be careful out there because Gehenna may soon be upon you. <laughs>